good afternoon everyone am i audible yeah. okay. so uh, my name is ritender uh, so that's my uh, role essentially uh, i lead this project leap uh, in a startup sort of environment so this is about uh, uh, logic engines for accelerated processing uh, so i'll be talking a little bit about that in the context of big data um so just to uh you know uh get some interest in this uh you might have heard that uh, about an year back uh, microsoft announced that they'd done this experiment for their bing search engine where they'd used these devices called fpgas for accelerating the page rank algorithm used for bing right uh so then you know intel announced that it is coming out with a, a xeon chip with an fpga device uh within the same package uh and uh, just about last month uh, intel announced that it's buying this company called altera which makes fpgas for almost 17 billion dollars so what is going on here right uh, intel invests billions of dollars in making these a uh, microprocessor it's very successful there so why all of a sudden does it need to uh, get into this fpga stuff what are fpgas and how are they useful right so to get some idea of uh, what's going on before taking a look at fpgas let's take a look at uh, a microprocessor right the kind of stuff that intel makes uh okay so before that i'll just give you an outline so i'll start by giving a mini tutorial of what fpgas are uh then we'll talk a little bit about you know it's a short talk so i'll give a taste of what uh fpgas how they are useful for big data then i'll give a more concrete example which uh is something that we have been working on where i'll show what kind of speed ups one can obtain using these fpga devices and doing the computation in hardware compared to software okay so uh moving to uh what a microprocessor what a modern microprocessor looks like right um so if this is a die of a amd bulldozer but intel chips also look so similar so if you'll notice the first thing that leaps out at you is that uh, about half of the you know die area is taken by the cache right there's the l2 cache and if you look closely you can see the l1 l2 caches um so um why is it uh, if you look at you know the history of die photographs you'll see that the cache size goes on increasing and the reason is something called the von neumann bottleneck right so um what's essentially happening is that the speed at which your uh, main memory is in a, the speed of main memory dram chips is not increasing as fast as that of the microprocessor so you need this paraphernalia of the cache hierarchy a uh, branch prediction buffers and all sorts of things uh just to keep the parts of the chip that do useful work busy so what are the parts of the chip that do useful work so one is the floating point unit that you can see below here right and uh, the other is the arithmetic uh and logic unit so it's difficult to find it on this die photograph if you look closely uh you can see it here right these are the integer data paths uh so if you consider these as the useful units um uh, one can make the case that uh, barely around 10% of the die and consequently so many of the transistors are only doing quote useful work right the rest of the stuff is just to keep that part busy right so um that doesn't seem like a very efficient way of doing things so uh you know what i'm doing here is i'm highlighting uh one of the uh significant inef inefficiencies in the way that a microprocessor does computation and this comment is valid not only for big data but in general right for uh, whatever computation one does uh, uh it's only around you know 10% of the area that's actually doing the useful work um so coming specifically to big data there is a significant number of big data applications if not the majority of them that are uh, streaming applications in the sense that you have lots and lots of data 
that you feed through and each data item is typically uh, processed just once, right? So search is a very good example of that. You look at each byte of your data just once uh, in general. Uh, so for such applications, actually, uh, the cache itself is not very useful, right? In fact, it's, uh, um, it's uh, almost useless, I would uh, go as far as saying, right? Um, so, and there are many big data applications which don't have much floating point. So, you know, uh, the point is that for big data applications, at least some big data applications, a microprocessor is a significantly inefficient way of doing computation and that trend seems to be exacerbating. So what does an FPGA offer us instead? So uh, this I'm just giving you, so we'll get into the details, but what I'm trying to show here is, uh, you know, give an intuitive idea of what an FPGA structure looks like. So there's a, you know, huge chip and you can configure the, what each of these logic elements does and you can get, you know, 10 to 100 times performance. So the uh, marketing slogan is uh, uh, hardware-like speeds uh, with software-like flexibility. So just to give a taste of it, uh, we look at the various building blocks. So this is the key building block of an FPGA. It's called a lookup table. So it's essentially a 8 is to 1 mux. And at the data inputs, I've connected SRAM cells, right? Or you can think of these as flip-flops. And uh, so supposing I write into these flip-flops, right? I write these values. Then the only time when I'll get a, uh, so, and I give three inputs there, right? So these are the three inputs, this is the output. So only time I'll get a one output is when all three inputs are one. So essentially what I've done is I've configured a three input AND gate, correct? And if I made this one zero and put one bits all here, I'll have a three input OR gate, right? So that's the essence of FPGA logic configuration. So by appropriately writing uh, configuration bits into SRAM cells, you can make uh, uh, whatever uh, logic gates one wants, right? And in current FPGAs, the size of the MUX is 64 is to 1, right? So you can make 6 is to 1 gates. Um, yeah, so that's a 3 input AND gate there. The other element are switches. So here again, you have a couple of MUXs. So you have two inputs, two outputs, and by writing appropriate configuration bits here, you can make it behave like a uh, 2 cross 2 crossbar switch. And by writing appropriate bits here, you can make arbitrary connections, right? So there are millions of such switches in an FPGA. Um, and uh, yeah, so writing these bits, you can uh, make connectivity, okay? So the third block is, you know, uh, you just use the lookup table and you need sequential logic also. So you add a flip-flop there and the output you can take either via the flip-flop or directly controlled by a configuration bit. So one has a sequential logic elvis also. So this unit is called a logic block, right? Um, so now coming back to the layout. So an FPGA consists of a 2D array of these logic blocks and these are embedded in an interconnection network. Lots and lots of wires with lots and lots of switches in those switch matrix matrices. So one can, you know, by writing appropriate configuration bits, uh, make it do whatever the application requires. And this will be much faster, right? Because it's a low logic, logic level. Um, yeah, so it's surrounded by IO blocks. Uh, um, and uh, now I'll give you some idea what the size of this thing is like. So what I've shown here is a three cross three array. A modern FPG has about a million such logic blocks. So you can imagine this as a 3000 cross 3000 array, right, of logic blocks. And sprinkled among these logic blocks, you also have RAM blocks. Each of these RAM blocks can contain 32K memory. So you can make really fast finite state machines and stuff. These memory blocks are dual ported also. And you have got these DSP units. So there are these multiplier, uh, adder, accumulator units. So on one of the top FPGAs, it does 20, each of these does 25 cross 18 bit multiplies. And there are a few thousand of them on the device. So essentially FPGAs are quite powerful beasts, uh, so long as one knows how to program them. So let's look at programming them. So essentially the process is the same as programming an ASIC, for designing for an ASIC, right? So you start with your logic design in an HDL, synthesize it, get the netlist, do place and route. Then the last step is instead of getting, you know, fabrication masks as you would for an ASIC, 
you get these configuration bits that you put on an FPG. So time rate is from few minutes to several hours. And just to give you an idea, so HDL, you know, you'll specify a full adder as it's shown here, right, in Verilog. So your synthesis will convert into gate level netlist, right? This will give you the adder output, this will give you the carry out. So when you do place and route, you'll get these configuration bits, which is a bit, bit sequence of uh, the configuration bits. And finally, you can, you know, configure it on your uh, lookup tables. So actually, these two lookup tables, if you look at the contents carefully, do implement these two logic structures. Right? So that's essentially how you uh, program an FPGA. Uh, so now moving on to big data, I incited your curiosity by talking about uh, Intel and uh, Microsoft. So let's talk about them. So OK, first of all, let's look at how you would use an FPGA, right? So typically, it comes on a, FP, a PCI Express board that slots into a standard slot in your motherboard. And via IO hub chipset, it talks to the CPU, which is connected to the DRAM. Um, so this works. This is very efficient. Uh, and uh, the bandwidth is not a problem at all. If you look at the PCI Express standard, you got you know lots and lots of bandwidth. right? Um, so this is the way currently things work, and they work pretty well. Uh, what Intel is trying to do is uh, the next step, essentially. Uh, they have announced that they are going to come up with a single package with the uh, Xeon and the FPGA connected with the Intel Quick Path Interconnect. So, and uh, this FPGA will have complete access to the entire Xeon memory hierarchy, right? So, they have announced it. Uh, they have uh, released some boards to the FPGA R&D community. And uh, if things go well, next year one is expecting to get you know some uh, commercially available products based on this. Sorry? Sure. Um, as far as I understand, they're both the same. Uh, AMD came out with hyper transport first, and then Intel used you know the engineers who had worked on DEC Alpha. And that group in Massachusetts, I think they developed QuickPath. So essentially, both are point-to-point -point links uh, for high-speed bandwidth. So that Intel claims that they get 2x performance for this uh, Xeon uh, FPGA combo just because they're using QuickPath here. Uh, yeah, so this reduces latency and really simplifies deployment, right? You don't need to have a PCI Express. Um, so moving on to what Microsoft is doing, I'll summarize it here. So essentially, they have also developed a mini board, right, on which they put an FPGA with around 8 GB of RAM. And what they do is they use a rack of 48 servers. So these are your standard 1U servers. And on each of these servers, they'll put one of these tiny daughter cards. And they connect these in a 6 cross 8 2D array. Uh, they use high-speed point-to-point SAS links. Uh, each, I think, is around 10 Gbps to connect a pair of FPGAs, right? And they've deployed this. They've done an experiment on around 1,600 servers. And what they were able to show is uh, throughput doubling with only modest increases in total cost of ownership and power. So they've uh, been effective in demonstrating that for data center needs of high performance, low power, flexibility, and low cost, uh, FPGAs can play a uh, effective role. So from what one hears, Microsoft is now expanding uh, these efforts. Okay. Um, so now I'll try to give you a brief idea of the power of these devices, uh, going back to a little bit of theory. So you look at a regular expression, right? So this one uh, says that it will match any string, which is a string sequence of A's and B's, uh, and the last two characters are C and D. Right? So this is one example. So one can you know, convert this into a, um, a NFA, right? And uh, um, so I'll just show you uh, the power of FPGAs by showing how easy it is to map this kind of logic structure uh, directly onto the uh, FPGA device, right? So all you have to do is you have to replace each of the states by a flip-flop. And uh, you just put in these AND gates for the uh, transitioning. And you get a structure that will do the matching. Uh, by the way, I have put these uh, colored you know, things. I didn't want to clutter the presentation. So these are links. 
So these contain papers and stuff in which you know you can find more references. So you can download and click, and you can uh, get uh, more details. So I'll just skip this. I'm running out of time. So I'll just talk about a little bit about what we have done. We have developed this XML processing solution. So this uses something called tree automata, which are better than push down automata. And uh, we have used this board. And I'll just skip the processing. So this is a schema validation example. And we compared it against you know uh, software uh, uh, the fastest we could find running on an Intel Xeon. And uh, this is the result that we get. So x-axis shows the file sizes from 64K to 4 megabytes. Uh, y-axis shows the throughput. So software is around 300 odd megabits per second. And uh, hardware goes up to around 3 plus gigabits per second. So we are getting around a 10x speed up using these FPGA devices. So we are utilizing only so much resources on the FPGA. And this is the current FPGA we are using. And you get FPGAs as big as this. So to conclude, you can get dramatically more efficient computation, uh, but uh, one needs a certain amount of uh, expertise in the area at, at present to leverage that. Uh, but devices and tools are improving, and uh, these devices have the potential to you know, be at least one of the workhorses for big data processing. Uh, I'm sorry about going over time. Uh, thanks. Any questions? Uh, Ritin.